Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Gustavo Tolosa. Many of you know me from webinars that I do every week. And um, today I have the pleasure and the honor of having uh, one of the uh, most well-known respected physicians in the world, and that is Dr. Dean Ornish. And uh, we will be talking a lot about his uh, last book. And so um, I want to thank you, Dr. Ornish, and welcome you. How are you doing? Thank you, Gustavo. It's such a great pleasure and honor to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to be of service in such a meaningful way. Well, wonderful, wonderful. This is a, a book club that I started you when the pandemic started and I didn't want to go crazy being <laughs> locked down. And so and it's uh, survived up until now. People seem to like it. So we will be starting to read your book um, next Sunday and it will go for almost, I think it's six weeks. And um, so uh, Dr. Ornish, um, for those of you whom those people who might not know you, although I don't know how that could be, <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit, just a little uh, bit about you. Dr. Aunt Ornish is the founder, and I'm reading him from the book, and president of the nonprofit uh, Preventive <clears throat> Medicine Research Institute, clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the author of six books, all national best sellers. He has had so many honors that if I could spend half an hour naming them, so you all will be able, we'll talk about that when we read the book. And he has directed uh, revolutionary research proving for the first time that lifestyle changes can often reverse and do, which is the title of the book, the progression of many of the most common and costly chronic diseases and even begin reversing aging at a cellular level, and who would not want that? <laughs> so, <laughs> Dr. Ornish, one of the things that I noticed, and this may seem like a silly question, I don't know, um, is that the book is dedicated to um, Luke and Jazz. Are those your kid, your children? Mm -hmm. That's my son and daughter. Jazz is short for Jasmine. Oh, okay, okay, well, I was wondering if it was he had to do something uh, uh, with music. Uh, well, in a way, she's our jazzy girl. She's a great musician too. Oh, okay. All They're right. Well, there. wonderful, wonderful. I that's my profession. I'm a college professor in music and a and a concert pianist. And so oh, when wow. I saw jazz, I thought, oh, okay, there might be. <laughs> Yes. Well, they're, they're, they both have Quincy Jones as their godfather, which is very auspicious. Today is his 89th birthday, actually. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Ornish, um, after writing six books that are national bestsellers, um, one actually, of the, uh, actually seven, including this one. Seven. Yeah. So <laughs> six. Plus this one, the seventh. I was going to say, what made you write the seventh book? And um, and I've seen your lovely wife in interviews. And so I just wonder what, what made you write the book and how much she contributed to this book. Well, she contributed more than half the book. Um, we've been working together for 26 years. And uh, I wrote, we wrote the book because awareness to me is always the first step in healing. And the reason that I've spent over 40 years doing randomized trials and demonstration projects is that properly done with the leading investigators and published in the best peer-reviewed medical journals, that we can redefine what's possible. And by doing so, we can give at this point millions of people new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. And that's what gets me out of bed every day. I love doing that. And so I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost lifestyle interventions can be. I'm known as the father of lifestyle medicine, which is a field of using lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but to treat and often even reverse it. And over the last 43, 44 years, uh, we've done research, again, published in the leading peer-reviewed journals showing that these simple lifestyle changes, a whole foods, <clears throat> plant-based diet that's low in fat and sugar, moderate exercise, like walking a half an hour a day with some resistance training, meditation and other stress management techniques, and uh, psychosocial support um, 
you know, to reduce it to its essence, to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more, that these simple lifestyle changes can not only help prevent, but often reverse the progression of a wide variety of the most common and costly chronic diseases. <clears throat> the book begins with a one of my favorite quotes, which is from Albert Einstein, that says, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So we try to take all this experience and knowledge and reduce it to its essence. Again, eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. And we've shown over the last 44 years that these same lifestyle changes can reverse not only heart disease, which you mentioned earlier, but also type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, we did the first randomized trial showing that these lifestyle changes may stop or reverse the progression in many cases of early stage prostate cancer. What's true for prostate cancer will likely be true for breast cancer in women. <clears throat> Pardon me, we did a study with uh, Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome, that these same lifestyle changes change your genes, turn on the genes that keep us healthy, turn off the genes that cause us to get sick. Um, you know, I, so often people say, oh, I've just got bad genes, there's nothing I can do. Well, actually it turns out there's a lot you can do. We found over 500 genes were changed in just three months after making these lifestyle changes turning on the good ones, turning off the bad ones. Again, not to blame people, but to empower them. And we did a study with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, ends of our chromosomes that regulate cellular aging. As we get older, as the DNA replicates, the telomeres get shorter. And as our telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter. And the risk of premature death from a wide variety of chronic diseases goes up proportionate to that. And it had been shown by her work with Alyssa Eppel and others that Chronic stress makes your telomeres get shorter faster. So does eating uh, junk food and managing, you know, and uh, and not exercising, being sedentary and being socially isolated. So I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things make them longer. And we found that for the first time, we could actually lengthen telomeres. And when we published this, the Lancet editors sent out a press release worldwide and called it the first study showing that lifestyle changes may reverse aging at a cellular level. And I think we're at a place with uh, Alzheimer's disease, very reminiscent of where we were with heart disease 40 years ago. In other words, the same biological mechanisms affect all of these different conditions. And I know there's a lot of interest in personalized medicine, but over these four decades, we found these same simple lifestyle changes could affect all of these different diseases that we've been talking about. And I was thinking like, well, why is that? Why can these same lifestyle changes affect so many different diseases? I was trained like most doctors to view heart disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, prostate cancer, Alzheimer's as being fundamentally different diseases, different diagnoses, and different treatments. But what I realized is that the reason why these lifestyle changes can affect so many of these different diseases is that they're not really so different. They all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, and telomeres, and gene expression, overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, changes in immune function, and so on. And each of these biological mechanisms, in turn, is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. And the more diseases we study, the more evidence do we show that that's true. It also helps explain why you'll often find what are called comorbidities. The same person may have heart disease and type 2 diabetes and be overweight and have high cholesterol and high blood pressure and so on. Because again, it's the same disease just manifesting and often masquerading in these different forms. Or why entire countries like Asia 50 or 60 years ago had such low rates of these diseases and until they start to you know, eat like us and live like us and all too often die like us. So it radically simplifies what we tell people. And it also helps explain why we're hoping that these same things may be beneficial for men and women who have early Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, 40 years ago, you know, it was thought that once you had heart disease, the best you could do would be to slow it down a little bit, that you couldn't stop or certainly not reverse it. We showed that while more moderate changes may slow, out, slow down the rate at which you get worse, more intensive lifestyle changes could often stop or reverse it, you know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure. And I think the same may be true with Alzheimer's. That's what we're looking to see. <clears throat> In other words, more moderate changes slow the rate of getting worse in Alzheimer's and slow the rate of getting dementia, maybe more intensive ones might stop or reverse it. So we're midway through the study now. Uh, we're recruiting a total of 100 men and women, and we're putting them through the same lifestyle program. And we're hopeful that we may be able to show that. And by the way, we're still recruiting the last group of patients. And 
It's all done at no cost to the people. We provide 21 meals a week for you and your spouse or caregiver for 40 weeks for the whole program. So if anyone's listening to that and has early Alzheimer's or knows someone who does and wants to find out more information, just go to our website, which is just Ornish.com, uh, which has information on that. And uh, 11, 12 years ago, Medicare, after many years of review, created a new benefit category to cover my reversing heart disease program, which was a real monumental game changer because when you change reimbursement, it changes medical practice and even medical education. And uh, <clears> then <throat> just last October, Medicare agreed to cover my program when it's done by Zoom, not just in hospitals and clinics and physician groups. And now anybody in the country, wherever you live, as long as you have you know, internet access can have the program, Medicare will, will pay the full cost of that. So we can now help reduce health inequities and health disparities and reach people in rural areas who don't live within driving distance of one of the sites we've trained. Right. So it's a it's an exciting time and uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to to do this work. It is. It is. And how how do people how can people take advantage of this wonderful uh, you know opportunity to do a program? I was going to ask you my next question was I mean, how do people participate in your program? Is it in person? Is it online? Is it immersion? I mean, how, how do they do it? Yeah, well, it was um, doing it in per Medicare will pay for four hours twice a week for nine weeks. And the okay. each session is four hours long, an hour of meditation and stress management, an hour of a support group, an hour of uh, exercise, and an hour of a group meal with a lecture. Um, and now ShareCare is providing the program nationwide virtually. And again, not only Medicare, but Aetna is covering it in all 50 states and Many of the Blue Cross Blue Shield programs like Anthem and so on or others are doing it as well. So if you have heart disease, um, you may be eligible. Again, go to Ornish.com and there's a place you can give us your name and contact info and someone will get back to you and see whether you might be or a loved one might be eligible for the program. That's exciting to me. And if we show that these things can help with um, Alzheimer's, then we'll have a network in place that hopefully we can expand it to that too. But first we have to show whether or not it works or not. Right. Right. Well, that is, um, uh, that, that is, uh, I didn't, I did not know that you could actually take the program, uh, like this. I, I think I heard you say in an interview that, um, Sanex causes dementia. Is that something that is still, uh, maybe, uh, that, that it may be the, one of the, the things that causes dementia? Well, that's one of many things, but people who use Xanax or Valium or Ativan, the, you know, the benzodiazepines is what they're called, um, uh -huh. do increase their risk of dementia. Um, but then again, so does a typical American diet and right. lots of other things right. that, you know, that we're, we're, we're changing here. Exactly. So it's a way I, of I'm, empowering people. A lot of people get a little uncomfortable and nervous when they see the word um, meditate. Can you tell us a little bit, because meditate doesn't mean, at least at the beginning, that you will have to sit for an hour and go, mm, you know, and uh, uh, what, what exactly do you require patients to do? Well, Medicare, Medicare meditation, uh, as opposed to medication, is the process of quieting down your mind and body to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being. And there are certain techniques that you can do that. You can meditate in a religious way. You can meditate in a secular way. It doesn't really matter. But one way to meditate is to bring your mind to one point. And there are certain sounds that have been found to be very calming, uh, which you find across cultures and religions and, and uh, both secular and religious. They generally tend to be words that start with an O or an A, and then with an M or an N, like Om is the classic, or Shalom, or Salam, or Amen, or Amin, or even the word one in a more secular way. And so one way to meditate is simply to close your eyes, assuming you're not you know, driving or around heavy machinery, and, um, and just say the, um, you know, like in the case of one, you know, one until you run out of air, or Om until you run out of air. Now, what will happen is your mind will wander. So you just keep bringing it back to the sound over and over again. So why would you want to do that when you've got a thousand things to do? Well, because it works. Meditation, um, first of all, it focuses your mind because you're focusing it on one thing. Anytime you can focus energy, you gain power. It's like focusing the sun's rays with a 
magnifying glass, you can burn through a piece of paper or focusing a laser is just focused or coherent light. All the waves are in step. You can burn through steel or bounce it off the moon. And our mind is really just another form of energy. In fact, Einstein, you know, equals MC squared, that energy and matter are interconvertible. So most of the time our minds are focused when we're angry or upset. So it has a negative effect on our minds and bodies. But by meditating in this way, you get better at focusing. So anything that you do, when you can focus better, you can perform better, whether it's in school, in terms of academics or world-class athletes, you know, all meditate now because it gives them a competitive advantage or in the boardroom or in school or business or uh, whatever you do. If you can focus better, you can perform better. The second thing is that it quiets down our mind and body. So when you meditate, your mind starts to get more quiet and peaceful. And then at the end of a meditation, it's important to remind yourself, to remind yourself literally that the meditation didn't bring you a sense of peace. It's not like Xanax, as you talked about earlier in another form. The idea is that our, our nature is generally, with few exceptions, to be happy and healthy. And not being mindful of that, we think that we have to get our happiness and our well-being from outside ourselves. <clears throat> you know, that whole advertising industry uh, sets, you know, has that uh, um, ethos, you know, you know, you have to get something to be happy and healthy or the whole medical model. You don't have to take certain medications to be happy and healthy. Now, drugs and surgery obviously can be life-saving in a crisis, but they don't really address, in most cases, the more fundamental causes of why we get sick, which are often are lifestyle related. And so with, at the end of a meditation, what we try to tell people is to say, the meditation didn't bring that to you. That's our natural state. So then the, the question shifts from, how can I get what I think I need to be happy and healthy to how can I stop disturbing what's already there? And that may sound like semantics, but the implications are actually quite profound because if it's out there, then everyone who has what you think you need has power over you. But if it's me, not to blame again, but to empower myself, I can do something about that. So if we think it's outside of ourselves, then often the, they go something like this. If only I had more, you know, I'm feeling mm. stressed, I'm feeling lonely. Right. If only I had more whatever, more money, more power, more sex, more beauty, more accomplishment, whatever, then I'd be happy. Then people would love me. Then I wouldn't feel so lonely. Then everything would be cool. Now, once you set up that view of the world, however, it turns out, you generally feel bad because until you get it, you're really stressed. And the stakes go up because the, so the stresses go up. It's not just winning or losing. It's being a winner or a loser, you know, and people like winners and don't want to be around losers. So until you get it, you're stressed. If someone else gets it and you don't, then it's really stressed. And it reconfirms this misperception that we live in a very hostile doggy dog universe, you know, zero sum game. The more you get, the lesser it's for me. And you only get it while you better get it. You know, you only go around once, better get it while you can. But even if you get it, it's very seductive in the moment because it makes you feel like, ah, I got it, now I'm happy. And, right. but then the problem is it doesn't last. It's like, you know, it's no. either now what, it's never enough or so what, big deal. It doesn't provide that lasting meaning. So right. one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about doing this work is that when people are suffering, there's an opportunity, not just to deal with a physical illness, but to deal with these deeper issues. Cause you know, change is hard, but if you're hurting enough, and people say, okay, that's, you know, I get the diet and the exercise, but meditation, that's kind of weird, but all right, it's got research proving it works. Let me give that a try. And then when they begin to rediscover these inner sources of peace and joy and well-being, they often say things like, you know, I got into this program because I wanted to open my arteries, but I'm, what kept me in is that my heart is so much more open in, in, in more metaphorical ways. Right, right. Um, Dr. Arnish, uh, continuing to talk about the book, someone was asking the title, that's the title. Um, mm -hmm. There are some wonderful recipes here in this book. Um, what are some of your family's favorites? Uh, would, would, would you name a few or what are some of your favorites? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I tend to eat more simply these days, but the simply, spinach lasagna yeah. is really a, a the spinach right. lasagna recipe and there's a a favor because it tastes so much like what people are used to eating. It uh -huh. doesn't feel like you're, you know, you have that sense of deprivation. And there's so many, you know, cliche myths like, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I eat healthily, you know, or the only way to get to live to be a hundred is by not doing or eating all the things that you'd want to do to get to be to live to be a hundred, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. But right. what we're trying to show people is that first of all, you can eat foods that's delicious and nutritious. You can make, you know, unhealthy food taste bad and you can make healthy food taste good and vice versa. I, you know, I learned that the best way to make healthy food taste good is to work with a great chef and work within these guidelines and the food can be, you know, delicious and nutritious. But also, 
what you gain is so much more than what you give up. These biological mechanisms that we talked about earlier that are part of this unifying theory are very dynamic in both directions. You can get better quickly, you can get worse quickly. And when the paradox is that sometimes it's actually easier to make big changes in a lot of things at the same time than just to change one thing a little bit. You know, the idea that small gradual changes are easy and big rapid changes are hard is sometimes it's the opposite because when you make big changes in your diet and lifestyle, and you do it in a number of different areas, you know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Most people find that they feel so much better so quickly, it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying to joy of living. And fear is not really a sustainable motivator. I mean, for a month or two after someone's had a, a scare, a heart attack or whatever, they'll do pretty much anything the doctor says. But after a while, they stop doing it because, you know, we all know we're going to die. The mortality rate is still 100 percent. It's one per person. So efforts to try to motivate people out of fear are not really sustainable. What is sustainable are joy and pleasure and love and feeling good. So for someone who's got heart disease, for example, and has such bad chest pain, they can't you know, walk across the street without getting chest pain or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work without getting chest pain. And within a, usually a few weeks, they're essentially pain-free. They say things like, you know, I like eating junk food, but not that much. Because again, what I gain is so much more than what I give up. These are choices worth making, not just to prevent something bad from happening, to live longer, but to live better. Right, right, exactly. Um, Dr. Ornish, about, yeah, I think it was six years ago today, I was in Lithuania, um, and I was there with uh, Dr. Hans Deal because uh, the whole country was going to, he was talking to doctors and institutions. Uh, Dr. Deal's wife is a wonderful pianist, and she and I were giving concerts in Lithuania while oh. Dr. Deal was, was doing that. So, but what caught my attention and it was so surprising is that the whole country of Lithuania was um, uh, ready uh, to go with um, lifestyle medicine. They really wanted to make it the standard. And of course, I don't know what happened since then, because a lot of things have happened in the world since then. But um, what do you think? Do you think that at some day in the near future or in the future, lifestyle medicine will be the standard way that medicine will be practiced? Or is that a kind of a utopia? Oh, no, I think it is. Uh, you know, I have a lot of family from Lithuania. I participated in that conference by Zoom. Uh, I also have a lot of family in the Ukraine. Uh, my Grandparents on both sides emigrated from Odessa in the Ukraine, uh, but we still have other family members there. So it's been a really tense time for the last couple of weeks because of that. But I think there is a convergence of forces in this country that after many decades of doing this work, finally make it the right idea at the right time. On the one hand, <clears throat> the limitations, again, drugs and surgery used appropriately can be life-saving. We've all benefited from that. But they don't generally address the underlying cause. So when somebody gets put on drugs to lower their cholesterol or blood pressure or blood sugar. And they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? The doctor usually says forever. I uh, when, Many years ago, I had a cartoonist draw a cartoon of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing. Like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, well, forever. Like, well, why don't we just turn off the faucet? And the faucet or the cause of so many of these chronic diseases are the lifestyle choices that we make each day. And many patients under their doctor's supervision when they make big enough changes in lifestyle, using lifestyle medicine, as we've been talking about it, can often reduce or in some cases get off of these medications they were told they'd have to take for the rest of their life. You know, 86% of the $3.8 trillion that we spend in this country last year on healthcare is mostly for sick care. You know, um, and uh, mostly, I mean, 86% uh, of that is actually for treating chronic diseases that can often be prevented or reversed by making these simple lifestyle changes. So if we really want to make better care available to more people, then this is how we do it. So at the same time that the limitations of drugs and surgery are becoming clear, I mean, for example, in the case of heart disease, there are now over eight randomized trials showing that stents and angioplasties, which are, you know, $100 billion a year business, don't prolong life in stable patients, don't uh, reduce angina, and don't prevent heart attacks. Uh, they're dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. They, they will help if you're in the middle of having a heart attack, but most people in the past especially got them to try to, who are stable, and they don't work that well. But lifestyle changes, on the other hand, can actually reverse its progression in most cases, and we found a greater than 90% reduction in the frequency of, of angina this time. 
Right. Uh, and so uh, at the same time that the limitations of drugs and surgery are becoming clear, the costs are becoming unsustainable, the power of lifestyle changes can often, you know, be often used as an, uh, as a, as a, instead of these things. And also we did a couple of studies showing that these approaches save a lot of money very quickly. We did a study with Mutual of Omaha where yeah. we found they, cut, they saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year. And another study with Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they cut their costs in half in the first year. So because of this convergence of forces, I really think this is the right idea at the right time. Right, right. Well, I can't wait. I guess I'm too impatient. I would like for it to be <laughs> <laughs> now. But it does help that Medicare and other uh, health insurance, is, hopefully they'll start to join and people will be more willing to, to do that. Um, Dr. Ornish, I know you're busy, so I'm just going to ask you one more question. Um, and the question is, if you had written this book um, a few months later or a year later when we're in the middle of the pandemic, would you have changed anything here? Would you have talked about how this these life changes might uh, help in fighting the this coronavirus? Well, I did. The paperback of the book of Undo It came out just uh, in January, and okay. I wrote a new forward for it where I talked about oh. there, there are two new studies that came out, just for example, in the last few months in November. One was from uh, looking at almost 3,000 frontline healthcare workers who get exposed to COVID-19 every day in six different countries, including ours. And they found those that ate a, a, a whole foods plant-based diet, like I recommend, were... Um, 73% less likely to get moderate to severe COVID-19. Those who ate a pescatarian diet, basically a plant-based diet with some fish, were 59% less likely to get moderate to severe COVID-19. But those that ate a you know, a typical American high animal protein, Atkins, paleo, keto diet, were 400% more likely to get moderate to severe COVID. And I think that's important because even if you're a triple vaccinated like I am, you know, there's still a, a lot of breakthrough cases with the Omicron variant. I mean, everybody right. shouldn't get vaccinated, but even then it's not 100% protective. So people are saying, what else can I do to enhance my immune function? Well, this is something that you can clearly do. And a second study came out of the Harvard School of Public Health, Walter Willett's group, and the King's, Co King's College in London. And they looked at 600,000 people, a large group of people. And they also found a 43% reduction in the likelihood of getting moderate to severe COVID and those eating a, a whole foods plant-based diet. So again, it's just part of this unifying theory that when you make these lifestyle changes, it helps in so many different areas across the board. Right, right. Well, whole food, um, someone is asking, what is WFPB, whole food plant-based? Um, yeah, not to be confused with WTF, which is something different. Right, right. <laughs> we don't want that. So, uh, well, uh, thank you so much. We have learned... Uh, so much from you and um, I just want to encourage everybody to get the book and um, there's a little sign up here join the book club we're going to have fun I will feature some of these recipes I love to cook myself so I'm gonna cook some of these and I'll have some chefs invited as well well um, thank you again Dr. Ornish and um, I hope you have a wonderful week. Oh, thank you, Gustavo. Let me just end in closing by saying I, yes. I'm more passionate about doing this work after 44 years than, than ever because um, it's just so empowering when we can kind of take control of our lives in this way and uh, how much better we can feel. There's a wonderful movie called The Game Changers that um, is a documentary showing how uh, so many elite athletes were able to raise their game and become national champions in various fields simply by eating a, a plant-based diet. It makes it aspirational to eat this way, which it really is. I began eating this way when I was 19 and you know, I'll be 60, I'm 68 now and I've never felt better. So I just want to share that I'm, uh, and, and for other people to know what is, you know, the biggest obstacle I find is that people think, oh, diet and lifestyle, that's kind of boring. How powerful could that be? It's got to be you know, a new drug, a laser, something really high tech and, and uh, expensive to be powerful. And again, our unique contribution has been to use these very high tech, expensive state of the art yes. safety measures yeah. to show how powerful these very simple and low tech and low cost interventions. So don't take my word for it. Just try it yourself for a week and you'll feel the difference. I promise you. That's what I always tell people. Just just try it for, I say 10 days, you know, just try it for seven, for a week and you will see 
Um, if you don't mind saying um, for people who may not, who may be new to this way of eating, what exactly is a whole food plant-based uh, diet? Is it a vegetarian? Is it a vegan? Is it, uh, what is it? It's essentially vegetarian or vegan, but um, that word is loaded for many people. So plant-based sounds better. Now people say vegetarian or vegan, does that mean you're from Las Vegas? You know, but anyway, uh, but it's fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products, things as close to possible as they come in nature. I mean, Twinkies are, are vegan, but you know, it's, it's uh, avoiding the processed foods, high fat, high sugar, eating, you know, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and so on. And again, if you're trying to reverse disease, you need to eat that way pretty much all the time along with these other things. That's what the Undo It book is about. But if you're just trying to stay healthy, the more you change, the more you improve. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Just have a meatless Monday or just, you know, eat some meals like that. And even that, you'll notice the difference. But if you eat this way, and especially if you combine it with the other lifestyle changes for, and do it in its fullness for even a week, you will probably feel so much better so quickly then it'll come out of your own experience, not because of these diet wars, you know, this expert says that, but the expert says right. that. Right. And you, then you say, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So let me do more of this and less of that. And then becomes, when it comes out of your own experience, that's really what makes it sustainable because then you just really know. That's what really makes it sustainable is when the, the person feels it. Um, and that's how I came into it. Um, uh, I in. In a week, I was another person, so I could never look back. And it's been exactly. nine years. So. Good for you. Well, again, I'm grateful for the chance to share this information. And if people want more information, just go to Ornish.com. Ornish.com. All right. Well, I will put it in the um, on the screen when the replay goes out. And the Undo It book, of course. Thank you again. Of course. Of course. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye, Dr. Ornish. Bye-bye, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you.